Right. Everybody ready? Y'all want to get started? You got thumbs up over here. All right. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans. For those of you who this is your first time here, welcome. And uh, we're on our fifth uh, session as we look and we've look, been looking at this uh, introduction that Paul has as he's writing to this young church that is in the city of Rome. That's hence the title. And um, he hasn't been able to go there personally yet. And he's been wanting to, but he hasn't been able to get there yet. But he wants to send them a letter because he knows of the struggles that they're having. Uh, they have some Jews there that are in the church, and they have some Gentiles there who are in the church. And each of them has issues with their background and how to take their, their old Jewish faith and beliefs and religion and the Gentiles, how they deal with their pagan world. And now that they're in the church, how does it all fit together? What to do? And they've got questions. And he wants to go there and help them with the questions. But he figures he's just going to start off by sending them this, this letter that has some of the doctrines. Now, history has proved this is one of the greatest letters of, of uh, Christian doctrine that has ever been written. And I don't know that he thought of it that way when he sent it, but certainly it's the reason why we're studying it, because it teaches us as Christians that what it is that we should all know. And so in the first seven verses is, is the basic introduction as Paul is writing this letter. He starts off, he introduced himself, called himself a, a, a servant, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus. Said he was a messenger, that's what apostle means. Uh, he was a messenger that God was sending, and God was sending his word. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament then, and they didn't have the Gospels or any of that sort of thing. Uh, their scripture at that day was uh, the only scripture they had was Old Testament. And the Gentiles didn't even have that. They, they didn't possess the scrolls for the most part uh, of the Old Testament writing. So he says, listen, I'm a messenger. I'm sending you what God wants you to know. I have been someone who has been set apart and given a, a particular job or a purpose, and it is to teach the gospel of God. That's why I'm writing you the letter. I'm a servant, I'm a messenger, and I've been picked by God to teach his gospel to you. And then he introduces the subject of this great gospel of God. And, of course, the subject is Jesus Christ. And so we talked about that. And Paul went on to explain in verses 3 and 4 how Christ had to be fully man of the ancestry of uh, David. And he also had to be fully divine. And he had that spirit of holiness inside of him that enabled him to live a sinless life. And so now we get to verse 5. And Paul gives us an introduction as what the purpose of the gospel is. What the purpose, uh, as he's introducing it. And he says in verse 5, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Now remember that in the, in the original language, in the Greek, Verses 1 through 7 is all one big sentence. And in some of your translations, you've got a couple periods in there. And certainly we've got it broken down by chapters and verses. So don't get hung up on verse 6 and verse 5 and verse... They're all part of the same sentence. So when he's talking there, and he's, so he's talking about the Lord Jesus. Because in verse 4, it ends with uh, Jesus Christ. According to the holiness of Spirit, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom... Okay? We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, what's the purpose? His purpose is to call out from among all the Gentiles, call people out to the obedience of faith. That's what he just said. So, We remember that he was called and given a mission. He'd already called himself someone who's been set apart, always called himself a messenger. And we're reminded of his great call and commission that happened to Saul. That was Saul became Paul when he began preaching to the Gentiles. Paul was his Gentile name. And remember when he went to the road to Damascus and that's where God called him? Uh, most of us did not get called in the same way that Saul 
was called. I don't remember any flash of light, and I didn't fall off my donkey, okay? And I didn't go blind for several days, and then Christ didn't come and, and, and talk to me. So we all got called in a different way. But his call was certain. His call was to go and be a witness to the Gentiles. Now, the, because of the rejection by the Jews, which resulted in the crucifixion of Jesus, this had now opened up the door for God to extend his calling to the Gentiles as he is building a people for his own. And so Paul even quotes Jesus when he's talking about this calling to call out a people from the Gentiles. He quoted Jesus' calling in Acts 26, 18. He says that when he was being sent to the... Jesus said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. This is what Jesus told Paul. This is your calling. You're to go to the Gentiles and tell him these things. Now, when you read through the book of Acts, we find Paul a lot of times, when he goes into a city, normally he stops, first of all, he'll stop in a synagogue and preach to his brothers, his Jewish brothers. Um, but we also know that the cities that he went to were primarily Gentile. And we also know that the hearts that were most receptive were the Gentiles. God has set him apart to preach to the Gentiles. God was working in hearts to prepare them, and he was sending Paul with the message to call out a people for himself. Same thing that Jesus said he was doing. That was the purpose for the apostle. So Paul says he's writing this letter so to help in the calling of men to, notice the phrase, the obedience of faith. Obedience of faith. What exactly is the obedience of faith? Nobody wants to volunteer. You're all shy tonight. Obedience of faith. Listen, John Calvin, he had a, in his commentary of Romans, he said it this way. He said, think of it like this. It's almost as though Paul was saying, it's my duty to discharge the responsibility that's been entrusted to me. And that is to preach the word. That's my job. That's what I've been called to do. It is your duty and your responsibility to hear the word and fully obey it. The obedience of faith. So what this is saying is that the gospel of God is something that God himself commands every person to obey. God is commanding every person to obey the gospel. Now, this kind of presents the gospel in a little bit different light than how it is most often or too oftenly viewed and how it's presented to people. When, when we tell people about Jesus, we normally um, don't include the phrase, and God commands you to obey. Do we? Because we present the gospel too often as something, well, it's not supposed to be something that's casual, make you feel comfortable, feel good, uh, something that we just really hope that somebody's going to hear and, and we tell them how it's going to make you happy and contented. And it's not just something that we, we, we highly recommend to people. And it's not something that we approach to someone and say, you know, we think you really ought to strongly consider this. And, and it's not something that, that we can talk them into by coming up with a list of pluses and minuses based on our interpretation or our, our viewpoints. And it's not just a, the gospel is not just a message that uh, uh, we can tell people and all about how sin is going to mess up your life and even make you miserable. And maybe you're miserable now because of sin. And, and you, here's how you fix it. 
You see, sin is the outright, deliberate rebellion against God. It is that rebellion against God and also the rejection that God has the right to have any authority over my life. And that's what sin is. It is the active choosing. In our last session, we talked about choosing based on our sinful nature or choosing uh, according to the Holy Spirit if He's inside of us as a saved person. But for an unbeliever, they don't have the Holy Spirit. So their choices are almost always going to be and have to be based on something other than the holiness of God within them if the holiness of, of God is not within them. So it's the act of choosing to ignore the words of God because we want to be free to make our own choices, to live our own lives the way we want to live. And we don't want to have anyone telling us what we should and should not do. Even God, especially God. Paul is saying that the gospel of God is a direct command to be obeyed. And that's what the phrase obedience of faith. Again, sometimes in the Greek or Hebrew, the languages sometimes they have to kind of break it down and put it in a way and different translations will have this in a little bit different format. One of the best um, the ways that some of the translations have it is faith, which is obedience. And, and that's the, the meaning behind that phrase. That to, to act in faith, which is in obedience to the gospel of God. Now the idea of God demanding and commanding people to obey is, let's, let's be honest, is shocking and foreign to a lot of people. But if you read through the New Testament, we can see this, this repeating itself over and over of God commanding people to obey and, to, and requiring that they come to this, this obedience. A couple of passages I pulled out for you, just to point this out, in Acts, in chapter 6 and in verse 7, that's Acts 6, 7. I got fussed at last time because I said my verses too fast. Acts 6 and 7. It says that the word of God kept spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase greatly. And a great many priests were becoming obedient to the faith. They were hearing and, obeyed and obeying the gospel message that was being first preached there in Jerusalem right after Pentecost. In Acts 17, uh, 31 and 30, Acts 17, 31 and 30, this passage occurs for us to see. It says, in the past, God overlooked the times of ignorance, but is now, what? Commanding all people everywhere to repent. God's not suggestion, making a suggestion. He's not making a reference. He is commanding all people everywhere. That pretty much includes all folks, right? All people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, Jesus Christ, he has appointed. God is commanding this obedience of faith. And again, Romans 16, 26, at the end of this epistle, Romans 16, 26, Paul writes, according to the commandment of the eternal God, and he's talking about the response of the, of the gospel here, it has been made known to all nations leading to the obedience of faith. So responding in obedience and faith is what God commands us to do when we hear the gospel message. It's not a suggestion. God is commanding all people to hear and obey His call. That's why in, in, in the study, if you remember when Paul was on his second missionary trip and he was in Philippi and he got arrested, remember they threw him in a jail and uh, over, they were singing and, and they got busted out and the angel threw the 
door of the jail open and he came out and the jailer came out. You remember what the jailer said? What, what, what must I do to be saved? And remember the response? It was a command. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you'll be saved. That's the obedience of faith. Believe. That's what you got to do. You've got to believe the gospel. You've got to hear it and obey it and believe that it's true. When you do that, that's how you have the obedience of faith. And you have to respond. God is calling, as that passage said, He is calling, demanding all people everywhere to repent. So the gospel of God is not just another religion. It's not something that people can just take it or leave it. Ah, eh, well, that's your, that's your beliefs. I got my beliefs. No, everybody, everywhere is commanded by God to repent and follow it. And it's not something that we can take and mess with. We can't dilute it and water it down and sugarcoat it and dissect it or ignore it. I don't care how much you might not like what God says in it. It is the gospel of God. It is the good news. It is the truth that comes from their ver the very words of God. No man can change it. And the pagan world from which these Gentile believers were coming from, they had thousands of gods. And these gods were always fighting amongst each other and playing one against each other. And they were using humans as kind of as little pawn pieces in their little struggles. And so as a human being, what you did is you went around all these thousands of gods until you found one who would say what you wanted it to say, wanted him to say. And that's what you would do. And if you couldn't find one, you just made one up. That's why they had so many. And so Paul is saying that's not the Christianity. There's only one God, one word, and that's what you need to obey. Those gods of the pagan religions, they're not the God of the Bible. They're not the God of creation. They're not the God who has all power and all wisdom and all knowledge. That's why the very first commandment that God wrote down for Moses up on top of Mount Sinai was you shall not worship idols of other gods. No, nope. I'm the only one. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, because I'm a jealous God. This makes me, it'll make me very angry. Do not obey that. I'm commanding you to obey my gospel. The very first act of worship is obedience. That faith of obedience that Paul said is what he was teaching. And it was the purpose of him teaching the gospel to draw us all into obedience. And the very first act of worship is obedience. And in fact, it's the only reason we're here. It's the only reason we were created was to worship God. And you can only do that by obeying Him. In the Westminster Catechism, they have questions. And some of you are a little bit older, you remember they used to have these little questions that would ask, what is this? And there was a standard answer. It was a way to help you learn certain doctrines. Well, one of the very first ones is, what is the chief purpose of man? What is the chief purpose? Basically, is what, what is the highest purpose? Why are we here? Is what he's answering. What's the chief purpose of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's why, that's why we're here. There's, there is no other purpose. So Paul is opening up his letter to this young church. And they're struggling to separate themselves from their past religions and their past traditions and their past lifestyles and then all these other philosophies. Remember, there was a lot of stuff in Rome because there was people from all over the world. And all of that was in there. And they're trying to figure out how to live a Christian life in the midst of all of that turmoil. And Paul says, look, God has called me and given me what, you, what it is that you're seeking to find. 
I am serving God by delivering His gospel message to you. And it's the great news of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both your King and your Savior. Some people say, I don't mind Jesus being my Savior. That will get me into heaven. I got a different whole attitude about Him being my Lord and telling me what to do. But it can't be one without the other. And he says that the reason we do this and we obey this obedience of faith, we do it, as the scripture says, to all who are believed by God in Rome, called to say grace to you and peace, and to uh, I'm sorry, and among all, all the, <laughs> among whom you were also called of Jesus Christ. We do all of this for his name's sake. For his name's sake. That's why. It's his glory. That's why we obey. His gospel. It is the very power and person of God. That's what the gospel is. It is Jesus Christ, the great news of Jesus Christ. It is both God's word and his will. So here in these first opening verses, Paul has given us so much stuff. Now he's gonna he's gonna dig back into almost everything as we go further. But he has already given us the groundwork of some of the uh, central doctrines that he will expand on as we go through. The, the dual uh, uh, character of Christ in being his divinity and his humanity. Uh, the relationship of genuine faith that goes along with obedience. Remember the Bible says without faith no one can please God. Well, you have to have the faith in order to obey, and you have to have obey in order to have the faith that he gives you. They go together. Also, we have the establishment of God's holy standard of behavior. That God has the right and has established what is and what is not right. And in our next session, we will briefly read about the calling of the church. And the calling of the church, that is the doctrine of election. That's going to be a lively discussion that we have there. But again, it will be the tip of the iceberg because he's going to address it a couple more times as we work our way through the gospel. But keep in mind, as he's introducing these things, he wants the young believers in that church to know that God loves them. And he has called them and he has set them apart. And he is sending instructions now to help them to live the type of life that will not only please God, but also be beneficial to them spiritually. And so this letter is for that purpose. And Paul said, that's why I'm writing it to you. I've never met you. I know a few of you. When we get to the end of the book, he's going to mention some names so he knows some people who are there. Probably from some letters, maybe some folks that he has come across in his travels uh, that were maybe in Jerusalem at the same time he was, but they lived in Rome. Uh, so he knows some folks that are there. Uh, but he wants them to know these things that God hasn't forgotten them. And just because they don't, he hasn't been there yet, like he's been to Ephesus and so many other places, that God has, isn't leaving them out to dry. That God wants them to have these things. And Paul will be there to help them. But God is right. He says, I'm writing this letter so that you will have the instructions from God. Because he loves you. And he wants you to know about his gospel. Hang on, I'm going to get there. But I'm going to tell you what. This ought to tide you over until I get there. And this is what the letter in this introduction that he is writing. In the next session, like I said, we're going to talk briefly about the calling of the church. Um... If you want to prepare for next week, one of the great things is read the first four chapters, first three chapters of Ephesians. Ephesians is all about who you are as a member of the church of Jesus Christ. It's all about your calling, all about your privileges, all about your duties, all about your responsibilities, all about the things, why God called you and what he has made you to be. And of course, Paul wrote that letter to give that description to the church, knowing that that letter would 
making us aware. The God of the Holy Spirit wrote all of these, and we study all of them for our benefit. But if you have time this week, I would encourage you to read those first couple chapters in Ephesians because he's going to touch on some of those things as we look at the calling, what it is to be a saint, what it means to be a call, uh, to be called, what exactly is the doctrine of election. How does God elect some people? Why doesn't God elect all people? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that in our next session. So we will go ahead... Any questions? All right, let's close with the word of prayer. Will you join me? Lord, we are so grateful for the gifts that you have chosen to share with us. Lord, the gift of the written word that we have before us, which is perfect and true. The gift of the apostles and the evangelists who you have set apart for the telling of your word, but mostly, Lord, for the gift of your Son, who you sent to be the source of our salvation. And he does that through other gifts, the gifts of faith and of repentance. So, Lord, as we continue in our study in the book of Romans, may we read it carefully, and may we study it and meditate upon it, and live according to your truths for the sake of your glory. It is in and through Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.